on your proposal that um, um, slavery history to be, to, uh, uh, should be taught in schools in Scotland, why do you think that is important? It is important, um, for example, uh, I will give you a, a case recently with, with a journalist who, who rang me. And uh, uh, the journalist, I said to, to her, I said, um, uh, you heard of William Wilberforce? And Have, she said, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody's heard of William Wilberforce. Yeah. And I said, okay, have you heard of Henry Dundas? And she said, no. And I said, well, how can you hear about w William Wilberforce and not hear about Henry Dundas? Because no Henry Dundas, no Wilberforce, in terms of the abolition of the slave trade. And therefore, that is critical uh, because that is about a white version of abolition. It, it has excluded the, um, the person who tried to stop it. And therefore, in fact, that part of the history, uh, people don't want to know. And that's what I've tried to, to do, is to ensure that we have um, a balanced representation of this history. Because in 1792, uh, William Wilberforce put forward a bill supported by the Prime Minister, William Pitt, that the slave trade should be abolished. And uh, Henry Dundas, a Scottish politician, then he was sort of a minister of war. He actually stated that it should not be abolished immediately. It should be abolished gradually. And he put forward an amendment to that bill with one word, gradual. And therefore that extended the, 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 the slave trade from 1792 to 1807. That's 15 years. And in 15 years, I would say about 630,000 Africans were transported into slavery because of Henry Dundas's action. So you cannot know about uh, uh, Wilberforce and abolition and don't know what Dundas did to transport black people into slavery. So at this point in time, your proposal that um, this, this history should be taught is, is the fact that uh, um, is it important that people, would that educate people on racism, on the racist issues that we're having, in, um, uh, in, especially in the West? Yes, because what we have is, if you look back at slavery, um, uh, the fact is that if you go back to Hume, who is Scottish, you know, David Hume and Immanuel Kant, and those two men put forward the concept that black people were inferior to white people. And that concept was taken up by politicians and slave owners to justify slavery and to justify racism, because that was the concept of these two men that led to the view about race, that people were different and black people were inferior to white people, and thus they could be enslaved. Now, therefore, the young man who got killed, George Floyd, in America, was killed for that concept that black people are inferior to white people. And therefore, when we have um, poor representation of black people in business, poor representation of black people within the white society, in Western society, it is based on that concept. And a lot of people have it and don't know. For example, uh, in one of my discussions, a white uh, a person said, but you're a professor and I'm just an ordinary person. So you're doing much better than me in the society. So what are you complaining about? And I said to her, let's go to um, the South of America and I'll be arrested before you. No matter who I am, if I go to, to, to certain parts of UK, 
are more likely to be arrested than you, even though I've done nothing. That's the privilege racism has given you. And what we want is for the schools, the universities, and other institutions to be aware of this history, because this history explains racism, and you cannot, in fact, talk about it. You know, um, yes, you can. You can say, oh, I've been, you know, you're a racist and, 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 and I've been badly treated um, or whatever. But people who don't know that's the basis of it will not change. Yeah. Because they think it's part of their culture. Professor, I, ju I was just asking you, um, is this a personal legacy for you? <laughs> um, well, in, in a way, I was just thinking about it just this morning. And, um, you know, um, uh, I remember my mother, you know, my dear mother, who used this, and I've just put it up on Twitter, where I just remember what she said while I was sitting out in the sun. And she passed away in 2003. And she um, used to say to me, when I make um, uh, excuses, she used to say to me, make sense. Make sense. And that means I have to tell the truth. And I have to tell the truth from um, uh, uh, my experience and my studies. So the whole idea of making sense is important to me. Now, I can't see you anymore. Is that okay? Well, well I'll continue anyway. Uh -huh. Now, what is important to me, you asked whether this was some sort of um, a calling or I felt that I had to do this. Yeah, so I feel I have. I feel I have because um, I'm from this slavery. I'm a descendant of this slavery. Uh, your proposal that slavery history should be taught in schools in Scotland, um, is that a leg personal legacy for you? Okay. Yeah, well, in, in a way, um, uh, you know, when I was a young boy, my, my, my mother used to say to me, um, when I make excuses, she used to say, make sense. And what she said, you know, make sense. And the point about that is that it's part of our colonial legacy, uh, because I should imagine that's what the slave owners and white people say to black people during slavery, make sense. And the point is that make sense meant to me, I must find out the reasons so I can defend my people and in fact myself. And the point is that I looked around, you know, since 2007. And I just had a feeling because 2007 was the commemoration of the abolition of the slave trade, yes. 200 years. Yes. And I started to look at the history very carefully then. And the one thing I noticed was that I was finding things which I, were, was, which, which I was not told about. So I was finding information that wasn't in, in books and it, it, I was never told. And for example, I sent to Jamaica to get the Jamaica telephone directory mm. because I was just a bit suspicious why, you know, Jamaicans have so many Scottish surnames. And the telephone directory came and over 60% of the names are Scottish surnames. And I thought, well, why hasn't anybody told me this before? My mother's name is Larmond. Mm. And it never occurred to me that it had any Scottish connection. My cousin's surname is um, Gladstone Wood. It was a quintessential of Scottish names. And my other cousin is Moat. And therefore I thought then there is something not right about this. And I started to read. And th there is also another aspect which I must confess, because my mom used to also say to me, when I became relatively successful, 
And when I got a professorship, I remember her telling her neighbor in London, um, um, the neighbor said to my mother, you know, they're all black people living in, in Haringey. And the neighbor said to my mother, uh, Miss Ivy, how is your son doing in Scotland? And my mother said, I was up at the window looking down, listening to them speak. And my mother said, well, you know, Mrs. Pennycook, fact is I live in Pennycook, <laughs> but it's spelled differently. Uh, Mrs. Pennycook, she says, um, uh, my son is just a vehicle, you know. He's God's vehicle. <laughs> and he's just really telling them what what is God's message. <laughs> And therefore, I then understand that I've made no contribution to anything I do. <laughs> as far as my mother is concerned, I'm passing it on. And although that's a very Jamaican African story in terms of how things are, that meant a lot to me. Because she also said to Mrs. Pennycook when she said, um, and, and, and well, what else your son is doing in Scotland? Uh, my mother said, you know, I just received my Doctor of Science, you know, which is a rare degree, <laughs> you know, it's a research degree. And my mother said to her neighbor, well, you know, Mrs. Pennycook, you know, I think he's still at school <laughs> and he's doing well. So again, um, my mom, she had a way of saying things. She knew exactly what she was saying. And these little things, the, the fact that um, I, 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 I realized that my people, you know, I didn't go to, I went to a church school in Jamaica. I didn't go to uh, the standard school that you could get exams and, and go into, you know, the, the civil service. I, I, I didn't have that privilege. My mom left me with her sisters when she left Jamaica in 1951. And I lived with her sisters until 1955. And I, she sent 86 pounds for me. And I traveled on my own from Jamaica to Liverpool, to London, to meet her in 1955. I didn't even recognize her, I couldn't, because she left in 51 and, and, and 55, I'd forgotten. And therefore all these things about our lives, said to me something has to be done and although I'm working on science you know I decided I also had to do something about this history to inform people to, to, to because you can't inform without facts uh, people respond more to facts than to myth because I can point out where Dundas's statue is I can point out where he's buried I, I knew where he was born and I knew that what he did about the slave trade. I, 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 I know what he did about San Domingo in Haiti. He lost 40,000 British troops destroying the French slavery industry. I know that he, he sent the governor to Jamaica to transport the Maroons to Nova Scotia. Therefore, with that sort of evidence, I knew he transported the Scottish martyrs because he didn't want them to vote, give them the vote. So with that information, I can change attitudes. I can change opinions. And therefore, that's what I, I realized. So my job, and it came to a head yesterday, you'll notice in the evening news, in, in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Evening News, that on the 13th of June, and the stories on my Twitter page, so you'll see that, where somebody wrote on the 13th a letter to the evening news to say, because of my contribution to getting Edinburgh Council now to write a new narrative for Edward okay. Dundas's plaque. Okay. Now, the, the, the council of that is uh, advocating for that as well in the council, yes. That's right. Well, the story of that is, for three years, I was on a committee. And that committee um, failed. We had two people on it. The present Viscount, the 10th Viscount. Henry Dundas is the first Viscount. So mm -hmm. that's his descendant. 
Yes. He was on that committee. And also the historian Michael Fry, and I'm calling names now, Michael Fry, the historian, and both of them obstructed the working of that committee because they didn't want a plaque on that statue which said Henry Dundas had anything to do with slavery. And that's was what I wanted, yeah. because that's the truth. And the, the fact is that there was one other guy, um, Adam Ramsey, he was, was with me. Mm. And for three years, we, we debated and discussed, and though they found arguments, which was completely fallacious, to stop it. And it, when uh, uh, the statue was taken down in Bristol, the council made a decision that the, the committee is finished. So we reached no decision, closed. I then put stuff up about Dundas, you know, that the committee had finished and, and this was right, and Dundas did that. And the public contacted me and said, what should we do? And I said to them, write to the council. And a lot of people did. And the leader of the council put up on Twitter that he's in recognition of what I've done. He's going to set up a new committee and, he's a, and he excluded the Viscount and Michael Friday's story, excluded them. I didn't ask for anything and I was included. And within five days, we had a plaque with a new narrative with gradual abolition and the six, over 500,000 people he transported into slavery, that will be on the plaque. The point is that that's how it is to try and get anything done. And I didn't do it on my own. George Floyd helped me. He did, because I described his killing as a crucifixion. And that, all that, we work together and we've got that. So as far as I'm concerned now, if I go back now to the Edinburgh Evening News, on the 13th of June, now people have seen that and say white people, and they don't want slavery on that plaque either. And that's the essence of all these things about plaques and statues coming down. The Viscount would rather that statue pull down than put a plaque on it, say his ancestors killed 630,000 people from Africa. Yes. He would rather it pull down. And the guy in the evening news then said, because this is important, I will know the reaction, mm. how racism really works. Somebody wrote in the evening news that I'm a chemist not a historian, so they shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> and therefore they should listen to Michael Fry, the historian. That's in the evening news. Nobody responded, black or white, in my defense. We've got to then look at these things because if we don't, then the public had accepted that. And the council, a council a member of the council, wrote in the evening news after that to say, yes, we shouldn't put a plaque on it. Let's make a museum and put the statue in the museum, that sort of nonsense. And I wrote a letter yesterday, which is now critical, mm. and the evening news published it. And I published a page from, information from a page of this historic book that said, you know, Dundas was a good guy and we don't want uh, um, um, you know, he, that he extended the slave trade on his plaque. I went to his book and I took out information from one page. And in his book, he said, this is the man he's defending, saying he, he was not a bad guy, you know, abolition was just, gradual was just temporary. When the prime minister says it was never. The point is that the page I took from his book said, Dundas was going to breed black people. He wanted women of 16 and men of 20. It's written in this person's book. 
And therefore, that is in the evening news yesterday. And I met with the leader of the Labour Council yesterday at a, at a sort of a gathering. Nobody said anything. But the point is that the general public now in Scotland or Edinburgh is aware that the historian who doesn't want slavery on the plaque was writing great things about Dundas breeding black people. And he called black people wretched blacks. Now, what I've just summarized is what we have to do. We can make hundreds of programs. We can talk as much as we like, but Michael Fry as the historian knows exactly how much you know. And he uses that to ensure that your children and my children and grandchildren will not progress. So that was a bit long, but that's the story of how racism can work, not just being arrested by the police or, or being, you know, charged for trying to change a, 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 you know, a, a, a bit of, you know, false money or something which killed that, that poor man. So racism is extremely complex and the way it is, it operates is like the story I've just given you for the evening news. With that, Professor, are you um, insinuating that it's a systematic, um, racism is systematic, that is difficult to deal with? And, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And I'll give you two stories. I went to give a lecture last year in Edinburgh. And w when I arrived, <laughs> the, the attendant said, you know, um, what do you want? And I said, I've come to, to give a talk. And she said, um, oh, um, uh, what time? I said, two o'clock. And she said, you can't be giving a lecture at two o'clock because that lecture is being given by Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. Right. Two weeks or so before that, I went to another institution to, and, and my phone went dead and I said to the guy, could I go in and charge? And he said, no. He said, do you know anybody in there? I said, I used to know the, the previous boss. And he said, the previous boss? Were you a chauffeur? So it is, it is systematic. It is it, almost in the DNA. And it is the... Believe it or not, those two men who devised the concept of race. And, you know, when we had COVID-19, black people had a higher, you know, infection rate. And what were they saying? They were just going to say, it's like sickle cell anemia. And therefore, black people, um, it's genetic. And if they got that, if they got away with that, then when you and I walk down the road, somebody will do us harm on the basis they think we're going to do them harm because we're carriers. And we had to protest. And they looked at the results again and the Times and, uh, and also Liverpool and uh, Edinburgh University looked at the figures and said it was deprivation. Nothing to do with our biology. So again, that's the reason why, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of these people who benefited from white people helping me through the system. I couldn't come through it. It's because, you know, um, I met one of my teachers in, in London helped. The professor I worked in as a te technician helped. He got me into university in 1961. I couldn't get in, even though I was qualified in 61. I then went, I got a degree in 1964, honest degree, at Leicester. I went to London. The only job I could get is peeling potatoes. And then I applied to Edinburgh. Well, I applied for another job before Edinburgh in 1964. And a politician told me to go back to where I come from and grow bananas. And I had to tell him it's difficult to grow bananas in Haringey. Um, because that's me telling him I'm going nowhere. Haringey was where I, my mom lived, and that's where, you know, I, to, to where I belong. So it's a sense of belonging. The main thing is the racist goes for your sense of belonging. Hmm. And therefore, 
that's what we've got to ensure that our children know this history. We were talking about it, the history. It's got to be taught and taught properly in school, not as an option. And therefore, so that they can understand who they are and the white community can understand who they are. And my attitude is we're one Scotland. And, and therefore, there is no way that we're going to have continue where somebody said, I'm a chemist. So what do I know about history? Don't listen to it. Because that is, is, is prejudice, it's prejudgment, it's not bias, it's not unconscious bias, it's conscious, it's racism. Professor, thank you. Uh -huh. I, I just want to um, ask you, what do you make of, one, the, um, those teachers in, in, in schools that are mm -hmm. objecting to your proposal, on teaching the history of slavery in schools. And the second thing is, how are you dealing with this all? <laughs> well, in the terms of which is more important about how we're gonna, those teachers who object. The point is that one of, you know, I was speaking to journalists who, who obviously have spoken to teachers and the system. So when they're interviewing me, I ask them questions. I say, well, what are these teachers saying? And one journalist from one of the most important newspapers in this country said to me, and I'll tell you what she said. She said, you know, the problem with the racism in schools, the teachers teach it as an option. And slavery, it's an option. It should not be an option. And I don't care what the teachers say. It should be taught exactly like maths and physics because it is there to change attitudes. And secondly, some teachers say they don't like teaching it to white children because it gives them a sense of guilt. Now, have they asked the children whether they, it's giving them a sense of guilt? The point is therefore, people are working against teachers, what the society needs. And speaking to, at a Zoom meeting of the uh, a labor group yesterday, I said to them, they said the same thing as you, you know, it's from the EIS, you know, the union. I said, how do you change things in this society? And, you know, I said, you find out who is responsible for the curriculum. <laughs> and whether it's the government or the council, then you, you, you approach them. And you say, we want the curriculum changed and we want this history in it because it is important for our society. A diverse society needs diverse knowledge and you need diverse representation. And therefore, that's what I said to the union. And my attitude is that whether teacher like, teachers like it or not, it's too bad. <laughs> the point is that it is what's good for the country that matters, not what. In, individuals think and so that, that's my view about the teachers and in terms of my own position my nephew rang me from london yesterday and he said you know uncle why are you making this stand you know and uh, you know aren't you worried and i said worried about what i said my ancestors had to face slave owners <laughs> unarmed you know, uneducated because they were educated. They, but they faced slave owners and fought so that I could be here. And you're going to tell me that I can't pass a statue of a slave owner? A statue, a piece of stone and a piece of metal when they had to face them alive. And therefore what I want is the narrative on the, the Gallery of Modern Art in Glasgow. I want it on, um, you know, Rodney Street to say Rodney fought to retain Jamaica because Jamaica was so important. To me, that's what I want. And without support, I'll still continue to do it because I'm convinced that when you take things down, in, in, in the Colson statue is now down. People don't even remember where it was. They don't, can't imagine it now. What does it mean not being there? 
at least when it was there, it was causing some trouble. <laughs> and therefore, I am worried of taking things down. And if they're being taken down by right wing racist, mm. I don't want them to do anything for me. If what I want, the next statue down, is racism. The next statue down is racism. And if they're going to take statues down, we might as well take half of Glasgow down. You know, we'll take half of Liverpool down. We'll take half of Bristol down. We'll dig up Jamaica Street. To me, it's a ridiculous notion. What we should, it is diverting attention from racism. Where in fact, we want our kids to be taught our history, taught about, the, and the white kids taught about our contribution to this country since 1562. We've been contributing to this country and therefore I want that representation. And I'm saying that because all of us are one Scotland and we're going nowhere. And uh, on the point of uh, celebrating the black uh, uh, contributions in Scotland, are mm -hmm. you in favor of Black History Month, Professor? Oh yeah. I, I feel that we, Black History Month should be every month <laughs> if it's taught in schools. But you, you see what I mean? I think the, the October Black History Month thing is, is, a, is just a, a, it was initially important, mm. very important, initially. And therefore, I'm not into debates, you know, like I've got colleagues saying to me, you know, we should get rid of the word black. Um, you know, and I just said to them, well, you can, you can be black Jamaican, black American, black African, you can do what you like, and you can use it if you like. The point is that we are one humanity, nothing else. All the rest is man-made. And therefore, if we, some people want Black History Month, have it. You know, why well, you not? Know, it's not doing any harm. And it, 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 but the, the main thing which is doing harm is that somebody in a national newspaper can say, my views on history are invalid because I'm a chemist. The truth is I'm not even a chemist. <laughs> I put that in the evening news. He's got even that wrong. <laughs> I'm not a chemist. So, you know, I just feel... Let's have our celebration. Do you know, and, and this may sound awful. I saw on Facebook yesterday, some person is saying, let's get rid of all the white statues of Jesus. You know, let's get rid of those. Then somebody said, what's the real color of Jesus? And somebody puts up a picture this morning of somebody, you know, looking Arab, which is brown. So that excludes black people from Africa. And it excludes white people and brown people. And that's how we end up with this ridiculous situation. Do you know what that could lead to? More racism. More racism. So when your kid um, uh, and my grandchildren go for an interview, he could be interviewed by a white person who then objects to somebody spraying paint on Robert the Bruce's statue. You see my point? Which has nothing to do with anything. Your, your son and daughter or my grandchildren, highly qualified, go to an interview and somebody who objects to somebody's brain paint could then act in that way. And therefore, nobody can act in that way if I say Henry Dundas did that and he did that and he did that and they can go and check it. That's a fact. That's what I want people to know. And Scottish people I've spoken to, the one thing they've said in, in unison, common, one common fact, why hasn't, it, why hasn't anybody told us this history before? And a white historian told me, Jeff, I didn't put it in my book in the 70s, all this slavery stuff in detail, because I didn't think the Scottish people could take it. <laughs> And I said, you are, that's insulting. That you're telling me you've avoided doing something. 
who gave you that right? You know, and 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 to me, that's the kind of racism you can call it institutional. You can call it what you like, cultural. These are the things we're battling against. And when I see them, I call them out. And and you people say to me, like you said of my nephew, what, why do you think you have to do that? I have to do that because my ancestors couldn't. And I'm educated and I've benefited from the sacrifices they've made. So this is a very, very small contribution to, 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 to getting this change, for people to recognize that, you know, we're different, but the same. And, and you're doing the same thing by interviewing me. The media has been critical in this fight because it is the only and the main way that is changing the minds and attitudes of the public. And that's what we've got to do. We cannot pass on. Do you know what I think is frightening? I even said it myself and it frightens me. I don't want to be responsible in this generation to say my generation passed on racism to the next one. Because that's what we'd have to say. Our generation passed it on because we didn't do enough. Or we did nothing. Or we didn't do it well. We must not pass this on for too long, for, for further generations, because we've been passing it on for 300 years. It, it, it's not acceptable. Professor, what was the response um, to, you know, you, you mentioned about the media reactions to your proposals, your suggestions. Mm -hmm. and, um, what was the government, uh, you know, take on this? And given the fact that you've been given, um, you know, you've been recognized by the uh, British uh, monarchy, you know, in that respect, how do you qualify your recognitions and also, you know, how is the government responding to your proposals, sir? Well, nobody has contacted me officially um, yet to say, you know, I'm on a, a diversity committee of the government anyway, at the moment. Um, it's a diversity and inclusion committee. We haven't met and I, I've not heard much of what's going on, to be honest. Um, and therefore, I then had a role then of, 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 of listening to ideas which has come to the committee and making my suggestions. But we probably need more than that, especially after the, the Floyd, Floyd's death. So the government, I heard, are discussing things to do with museum, you know, having a black, um, you know, or a slavery museum. I don't, nobody's contacted me about that. But, they, but Edinburgh Council did, you know, ask me to work with them with regard to, to the plaque. And I think there are other proposals for the future. And I've said I will work with them um, on, 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 on anything they do. I've had a, a politician contacted me and said he wanted a museum for his city. <laughs> um, and he said, can I use your name? I said, of course you can. <laughs> this is no secret. So there are little things like that that have come in. But the important thing is that you, as part of the media, the more we put out to say, you know, this is needed, or this put out the voices to say, um, you know, th these changes must occur and the government must uh, become a part of it because only the government can make these significant changes in, our, in our, our schools, in our institutions. I, I, I gave an example yesterday that somebody said, but how can we help, you know, getting, you know, black people into um, managerial position? You know, I said, um, black, more black people out there are qualified and, and are not using their qualification. There are a whole load of them. Same with the Asian community. And um, I gave them the example. I said, the NHS Lothian, a, a few years ago, looked at their managers. And you're talking about nurses, highly qualified. 
And they realized that they just had about four BAME managers. And they set up a, a, a training. With, I was involved in that. And a lady called Mrs. Suleiman. And uh, uh, we looked at the, what you, the concept I've got, which is called system consciousness, which helps people, both black and white. If you understand how the system operates, then you're capable of, you're more, more capable of negotiating it than without that system consciousness. It's not mean compliance, it's, it's knowing. So whether you're in Jamaica, Nigeria, Ghana, or, or United States, you need system consciousness. And we then put that course on. Both managers, white managers, and BME senior staff who were not managers. And within just over two years, we went from four to 28. 28. That means if you know what is required and you identify that we've got a system which is racist, a system which excludes, you know, BAME people, then you can devise a strategy to correct it. It's because people will not look at their situation and will not, in fact, go out their way to do that. And the Equality Act, you know, 2010, demands that of them. So they're breaking the law. So, you know, that's my view on that. And the government, if the law is being broken, then the government must do something about it. And, you know, okay, you know, I'm a knight at the realm or a OBE or whatever. As my mother says, she used to say to me, I used to say, mommy, are they going to give me an OBE? She said, you go and take it. And when you go to Buckingham Palace, make sure you wear your vest because sometimes these big places are cold. And therefore, and then she said, you know, the trouble with us, you know, people say we can't earn anything. And when we earn it, they say, don't take it. And therefore, she said, you go there. She was too ill to go herself at the time. It was in 2003 when she died. And therefore, as far as I'm concerned, my ancestors, they say they couldn't earn anything. Nobody has given me this. I earned it. And therefore, I, I, it is there. I don't need it. It doesn't, you know, get me free shopping at Tesco's. <laughs> However, it says to the system, if you thought this was some accolade which black people can't get, then we can, just like we can be doctors, lawyers, engineers. Um, and therefore, we want a role. That, that gives us some control and management because if we are involved in the management, you're, you're more likely to make a better decision for the whole community. And, and therefore, that's what I've been saying. And I, I'm 80 years of age now, so you know, I don't know much longer I've got. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Um, you know, but um, I hope I'll be here long enough to see some people take up the baton after me because it, it is a, a race that we've got to win. Talking about taking the baton over you um, in terms of, uh, you know, what you leave behind. Yeah. If, you know, God forbid, you know, we're not praying for that prof. <laughs> we no, 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 no. We want you to be around with us for, for a very long time. Um, I think it's, it, 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 what should... Is it education or is it economic power, uh, uh, empowerment that we need? Well, what we need, you know, I just saw some figures yesterday that I think it was like 60%. We have 60% of the financial capacity of the white community. So therefore, there is a, a, a financial aspect. And if people can't afford to eat properly, then they, they don't work very well and therefore that is something we have to you know um to look at and and try and redress the point is that you know what are the reasons 
you know, we're probably in more more low pay jobs than the the you know, um, and we these low pay jobs exposes us to, you know, like with the COVID, higher death rates. So somehow the government, for example, yesterday I heard them saying they're going to try and address the thirty points on the Windrush compensation um, situation. It, it has taken this. You know the, the crucifixion of that young man in America uh, uh, to 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 drive this. So what we need, as I said, that the NHS Lothian did, is to look at their the 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 systems of work where black people work in, and look at why they are not in senior positions, and and address that because it isn't ability. It isn't genetics. It isn't because we are less intelligent, which people have been trying to prove for, for, for you know, since since you, you know, because they would like to get that as a as a, a genetic fact, and then they would say you're sixty percent worse off because you're sixty percent less intelligent. You know, that's what people are. So we, I went through that with Enoch Powell. I had to walk down the street and listen to that on the radio. You know, rivers of blood. I had to listen to Nabarro saying, do you want to bring home a, a, your, your the little blonde daughter brings home a big black guy? How would you like that? I had to listen to Smithick, you know, where the politician said, if you want a, you know, an N word for a neighbor, vote Labour. And he won the seat. So we have all that, those are facts. And believe it or not, those, that's in the consciousness. So we've got to say to each company, how many, um, and, and I'm working with one of my friends, um, you know, um, you don't know if you know him, called Silence. And we're looking at a justice, setting up a justice um, group. And that justice group, we are going to lobby the government. Um, and other people to justify why you don't have enough BAME people working for you. And we want that changed. Um, so we're working at that sort of level. But my hope is at the end of the day is that this poor or unjust, uh, you know, um, representation figure, this unjust. Um, economic difference, as you said, you know, and I only looked at figure yesterday, sixty percent, and this is just unacceptable. So, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm not. You see, again, we don't in in Edinburgh Council, we don't have one BAME person, not one, of over sixty councillors. Now, why is that? If people feel disenfranchised from the system they don't even want to go in to 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 become a a a, 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 a counselor and that's a sad situation so we want to encourage people to go into that sort of political position so they can help make decisions i said it to the council the other day to try to help a, a, a group of people to get funding and what i said it shocked a lot of people i just said in the hall and i said to the to the councillors i said do you see the situation in this room and there was silence you know because they didn't know what i was going to say and i said um the people giving out the money are all white and they're over there the people asking for the money are mostly black and they're over here this is 2020 you know this isn't, you know, 1860, 2020. You who are giving up that, and this isn't, it's not me being racist. I'm just saying this is a fact. And the councillors looked at it, and one of, one of, you know, two, you know, have acknowledged that that was the case. <laughs> so these are things which, you know, we've had lots of events outside. But nobody is saying, you know, um, call it out. 
and say this has to be addressed. So the question you've asked is, is that we've got to, the facts are there in front of us. And we've got to find strategies like the NHS, NHS did to try and redress it. What's the future for Scotland, Professor? What's, what's, uh, what's the future of Scotland? Future? Yes. Um, I think, as I've said, you know, I made a video for the Scottish government and it says we are Scotland. And I think that's my, my, my vision for the future, that we're not going anywhere. You know, our ancestors worked for this country, you know, and we worked for it a long time. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, I, I, I've, I've worked it out. I've worked it out from John Hawkins or Jack Hawkins, Jack Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Jack Hawkins was the first person who decided to take slaves off the Portuguese and sell them. And that was 1562. So Jack Hawkins in 1562 did that. And from that time, we've been working in, by millions of us for this country. So I do, nobody could attack this country if I'm in it. <laughs> because this is my country. And therefore, I want the same rights for, for my children and other people's children, no matter what color they are. When I did my research on barley, you know, with, with, in, in terms of my work, I didn't say, you know, um, my work can only be for black people. <laughs> it is work on, on science, which benefited. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was speaking to a journalist, um, and it's a white journalist, and he said, oh, well, you know, you're, you're, you know what do you do for your... In, in, when you're not working. And I said, oh, I just, I don't do very much. Sometimes I have a beer, um, you know, um, uh, but that's what I do. I don't know what she said, beer. He said, um, I like beer, you know, I, I like beer. And some of your beers up in Scotland are pretty good, you know? And I said, oh, I, I don't want to call in names because I upset my students and the people who are working in industry. But he used, he, he referred to a couple of industries up here, uh, brewing industry, you know, companies. And, and, and I said, oh, those? Well, I taught, you know, I taught both the, 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 the people who own them, own them, the owners. I said, they're my student. <laughs> and he went, students? He, yeah, I said, yeah, they're my students. <laughs> and he couldn't, he's in England somewhere, he drinks the beer down there, and he couldn't believe that it was that that is 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 cultural product. The person who taught the people who own it, not just work in it, was taught by an ex Jamaican, you know, who came here. I'm still a hundred percent Jamaican. I'm not living in Jamaica now, but my attitude is that I'm a hundred percent Jamaican. I'm a hundred percent Scottish, and I'm ninety. 7% African by genetics. So 70%, 70, 97%, 97% of my genes are African, spreading from West Africa to East Africa. I've had my DNA done. So I'm 100% Jamaican, 100% Scottish, I'm 95% African by genetics. What should, we be, what should we be doing, Professor? What should we be doing um, in terms of emancipation of uh, the next generation of Black and Scottish? Uh, uh, say that again? The, uh, yeah. what, what, what do you think we should do in terms of emancipation of, uh, of uh, the, the future generation of being Black and Scottish? Well, the emancipation, I'm not, emancipation is something where you've been in some sort of enslavement. <laughs> and I don't see myself as being enslaved here. Well, that's what we find with a lot of the, 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 the you know, the, the, the current, uh, perhaps the younger, not, not okay. the, the younger and uh, younger generation that they face racism. 
Of or, course. I've been speaking to a young um, a nurse and uh, mm-hmm. and Kera. She's well qualified. She's been in a job. Just some of the things that you've mentioned in this interview. Right. And, uh, you know, she's looking to, to progress, but she's not getting that progression. But people that have come behind her uh, have right. progressed, you know, further than her because they are not black and Scottish as her. And all she knows about, well, she's from Africa, but all she knows is Scotland. She's never, you know, she doesn't know anything about, not that she doesn't know anything about Africa, but she knows that that's her heritage. However, she's grown up here. She's been educated here, just like myself and a lot of other people. And these younger people, this is what they face. This is what they say. So I'm thinking that's, that, that continue. You know, you, you're doing a, a group proposal to say, you know, we don't want, you don't want the future a generation of uh, black Scottish, uh, uh, you know, to be misinformed about the history. Right. But the current generation is facing in those things that we're doing. How do we address that now? Okay. You, yeah, so that's oh, yeah. about emancipation. Okay. Well, I think that, you know, some of the things I've said, when you track back, w- what I'm trying to say is that the system has this you know, they call it institutional racism. The, the present minister changed it to institutional ignorance, which, you know, again, is play with words. What she should be doing is dealing with the actual situation. And the actual situation is, as you said, that, you know, like that, that, that nurse, but the point is that that nurse should be on that training course. If so, if she's... Um, you know, is struggling to get into managerial position, then she must get in touch with, you know, Mrs. Suleiman, because she was the person um, who, the black person I knew who was running that course. So again, some of it as well is we, our people are not informed as to, you know, how they can complain, funnily enough. You know, they don't know the process of complaining. Some of them don't because they fear of getting into trouble. So somehow what we need is, and I said this to the people um, who are running the Windrush um, a, a situation, I said, people must lobby for an organization that has links with the powers that be. If you have just a, a community organization and it has no links with the council or with councillors, no links with the parliament, no links with schools. So when you set up an organization and the media can help is to set up structures like Citizen Advice Bureau, you know, that is there to help people in general with difficulties in the community. And that is statutory funding that keeps it going. A lot of organizations I'm on are not not funded in a statutory way. So every six months they're they're struggling to apply for funding. That doesn't work. What we've got to do is to get, if the parents, you see better off parents don't need all this. You know, they know the school systems, they go and complain. They got the things and they get their kids through to university without a lot of problems. But where, in fact, you've got parents who, like my mother, who didn't understand the system, didn't know how to address my needs, I was lucky. You know, I could do that for myself. The point is that we need, where parents are not capable of addressing the needs of their children, then we need, we got to lobby for organizations that have that responsibility, just like Citizen Advice Bureau. And they've got to be statutory funded. And if, and, and if 60% of, of our people are on lower salaries or lower income, then the, the media, they've got to put this forward and say that must be corrected by organizations that will deal with that issue. And these organizations must be put in place because if you don't, you're subscribing to racism and the system has got to be told that. If you don't address that issue, 
by the best possible means, you are contributing to racism. And thus, nobody, I think, would want to do that. So this is how these things have to be solved, because if we just say, you know, it's racism and it's terrible, it doesn't help the parent. You know, we've got to now say to the government, looking at that, the only way that's going to be addressed, you need a representative body, because we don't have these people in parliament. If we had enough black people in parliament, or as councillors, then you could go to them. You know? And that is the issue. It's so simple. But we don't have black people in our government. So where they're not there, we've got to get some organ, black organization or, 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 or an organization, I don't care what color it is, providing that organization is addressing the needs of black parents and their children. So you see the logic. We look at the parliament, the council, we haven't got any black people there. <laughs> They're the ones who would help us to convince the government. <laughs> and because we haven't got the people there, we've got to think of a structure mm. that will do that. So Jeff Palmas, I thank you very much for talking mm. to Jambo Radio. We really appreciate your time. For thank you very much. Yeah, really. It's very insightful of what you're saying. Is there anything that you would like to... We ask this all the time, sir. So, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, is there anything that you would um, like to say to our people which I've not asked you in this interview? Okay. Um, no, I think you, you, know, you covered um, a lot in terms of, of, of... And it's good what you're doing because you're keeping it to Scotland in a sense that, you know, whereas some people talk, they... They're talking about, you know, black problem worldwide. And I think, yes, we, we have an eye on that, but it's our job to look at what our people need and then try and find the best way of helping them. You know, and I think if, if, if and I think this is what you're doing and you need to continue to do that because you are then providing a voice to the powers that be to say, these things are, are, are out there and the, and, and the people don't have the voice to reach you. And for God's sake, you know, we are one country. And as I say, you know, if Scotland is being attacked, none of us are going to say, well, I'm Jamaican and I'm African and I'm whatever. You know, we're all gonna fight together. That's right. We're gonna fight together then our needs need to be addressed together. So Jeff Palmer, thank you so much for talking to Jumbo Radio. We really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay,